we like building that up good design and they need to satisfy us before we present to the client. Episode 85. Hello and welcome to the Business of Architecture UK. I hope you are all well and staying safe and sound whilst we are dealing with these unprecedented times of the coronavirus and I hope you're all keeping your hands clean and that you're practicing social distancing. And I actually went and visited, so this interview, it was done a little while ago, um, right at the beginning of the isolation period and the lockdown. And I spoke with Daniela Sini, who is an architect at Richard Markland Architects. And it's an interesting interview because we'd originally scheduled the conversation to be about some of their innovative use of virtual reality and how they've been combining a gaming software to produce real-time or very fluid moving three-dimensional renders of their projects uh, which you know can be shared amongst consultant teams and the clients really really powerful combination of innovative technology that they were using and when we did the interview uh, they'd just begun remote working in their office and had half the staff uh, not in the office. And we discuss about the impact of that and how they've actually set themselves up technically to be able to be working remotely. Uh, and it kind of fed quite nicely into their workflow and the technology that they're using in actually delivering their work and how that can all be done remotely. So over the next few weeks as well, I'm going to be kind of um, talking with a number of um, technologically innovative businesses about how they're working remotely, the kinds of software that they that they're using, and also actually talking to some of the software developers behind bits of technology that's specifically designed for architectural practice. So sit back and enjoy Daniela of Richard Markland Architects. So massive thank you to all of you for listening and supporting the Business of Architecture UK for the last couple of years. Big shout out to those of you who have come to our live events, attended the webinars, and of course to those of you who have downloaded the weekly podcast and have been listening to them on your bicycles. And as you know, we love helping architects win meaningful and profitable work, but it's not always that simple to implement these ideas or translate them into something that will work for you. So what I wanted to do was to invite you onto a quick 15 minute chat with myself we can both grab a cup of tea and I'd like to ask you about what content you found most valuable and why and what you'd like to hear more of and I'd also love to hear more about your business and what you're building at the moment and where you are headed to business wise in 2020 so there's no charge or any obligation with this call just simply to find out how our content has been of value and if we get that far and with your permission of course what might be next what might be possible and how Business of Architecture UK could be supportive of that. Does that sound fair? Brilliant. So if you want to book a 15-minute chat with me, I'm calling these calls the BOA UK Discovery Call or just simply a chat with Ryan. Use the link in the information and I look forward to speaking to you. Daniela, welcome to the Business of Architecture. Thank you very much. Absolute Thank pleasure. Much. It was a pleasure, you. yeah. I've been listening before, so I was quite surprised. I mean, we met before, so... Good. And how are you... Obviously, we're in very unusual circumstances. Yeah, we're in the middle of a pandemic. So, um, as you can see, I mean, our office is so big. It's five of us at the moment. Um, but only three of us in the office and screen working autonomously, as you see. Um, so, since about 10 days ago, we sent two of our staff back home because um, one has to travel, taking lots of public transport. He has a young family as well, so we thought better stay home, yeah. avoid unnecessary travel. Um, and the other member of the staff, she was a bit scared, concerned on traveling, so we said just stay home, no problem. The technology is there. Yeah. I've been working from home a lot because I have small children as well, so they get sick. Uh, it, it's just more flexible. 
Yeah. So whenever I need to work from home, I just leave my computer on and I can control from home. Well, it, it's quite interesting because obviously we uh, had discussed talking about Richard Markland Architects, how you guys are set up digitally. You're being quite yeah. innovative with a lot of your workflows, the way that yeah. you're producing uh, built information, the way that you're communicating visually ideas to clients with you know, very exciting combination of, of, you know, three graphic packages using gaming technology, very innovative stuff. How, how well have you been finding it easy to be able to sort of go into working remotely as an office? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Also because I, as I said, I have been doing lots of research because um, in my previous practices, um, there weren't, they wouldn't say they were against, but they didn't promote at all the remote. They found rather inconvenient for me because I was a leading project. Mm. So when I wasn't in the office, they thought, who is leading the project? But, you know, all the stuff that be working with me, they, they always knew everything was going on in the project. I've never been someone control freak. You know, I always give ownership to all the members of the team because mm. when I'm not there, they need to be able to answer. Yeah. So that that was been my policy. So um, I never had problem uh, when I was working from home. You know, the project always met the deadlines with the quality that you you would expect. Um, but when once you get senior, you know, they expect you to, to be always in the office to to look after the staff and so on. So I've been always trying to test in how I can work better and more efficiently from home. So when I joined two years ago, when I joined Richard Markland, there was really open book, you know, you can work from home, no right. problem. And uh, I brought a piece uh, on the AJ about that as well a couple of years ago. And I think it's about, you know, it's about the attitude that you how you train your staff, how you sort of uh, give the feeling that the project is, is the result of a teamwork. Yeah. So everyone should be proud and responsible for it. It's not just something you have to do because you have to do it. Yeah. You know. You have some ownership and responsibility. Exactly, and exactly. And uh, and everyone you know, working on, on the project. We have one big project which is on site and some other small stuff that have been put on hold now because of the situation we are in. But I remember first time they went on site, they were so happy because they've seen a lot, the digital copy yeah. of the project, but actually seeing the physical copy, which is pretty pretty similar. There are no major difference. It, it was, you know, that make them feel proud because so they could understand what we were aiming for. So, so walk me through some of the tools that you use in Richard Markland Architects, firstly to work remotely, and then secondly, we can start talking about how you produce your 3D work and built information yeah. and those kinds of drawings. Uh, so to work remotely, it's pretty straightforward. We just uh, use the Google Remote Desktop because then you have all the software there, you can access all the file, you see your screen, all the setting is there. Um, the small inconvenience is we use two monitors um, and at home you have your laptop, but we found the settings that they work better, we want, so everyone now is pretty fluid. So as I said, uh, those two guys have been home for the past 10 days. And so, so it's a remote desktop, basically, yeah. where people are, they can just literally log on from any computer? From any computer, yeah, as long as you install um, the Google and you know your, your code, you know the, we normally tend to log off at the end of each session, so the screen, because otherwise if you're working in the office, the screen is constantly on, Yeah, and then people use the password to... So, we, so we've got this interesting situation here where you've got two empty chairs, but their computers are on and you can actually see them moving blocks yeah, around yeah, the microstation. Yeah, it's quite freaky sometimes. Say, oh, what's going on? <laughs> like yeah. kind of ghost, ghost, ghost. architects. Yeah, yeah. And, and so that doesn't require um, 
additional licenses for CAD software or MicroStation? No, because like it's all the software is installed in the machine that they normally use. Right, so, okay. And so does it mean that those machines have to be on? That, that's the downside. So because this is a situation still ongoing, we don't know if it's going to be a completely locked down that we cannot access the building mm -hmm. and there is a power cut. Right. So we're thinking now to uh, install another server at Richard Home, just in case. And probably, depending what the situation is evolving, we're going to take each machine at home. So everyone is going to have actually the physical machine at home and then remotely connect to the server. Right, okay, so which... But, yeah, but then you have your machine with your own software, so it doesn't matter, okay. just the data is stored right. in the server. Right, okay. So, so you, the, you, have, you have everything on the cloud, essentially, yeah. in terms of your, your drawing yeah. information. Yeah. exactly. And then the packages are all... So that, that's going to be the second phase. At the moment, we're in the phase where everything is in the office, you just, yourself, working from home, basically. Got it. Yeah. So it, sound, it sounds like quite a good... Quite a good setup, yeah. Already yeah. It seems to be yeah. able to, to yeah. working. Has it changed? I mean, I suppose you, you said ten days you've been working like this, yeah. And has it? What are the what are the opportunities? What are the constraints? Well, the, let's start with the constraint. Constraint is always have to give it a call, even to do simple stuff. <laughs> Otherwise, you spend lots of time emailing to give instructions. So it's much cheesy just to pick up the phone and call them and say, look. This one should be like this. And so it's not like walking to the desk, you talk, you can sketch, uh, ex express yourself a bit better. Uh, so that's probably the major constraint. Uh, Do you use any uh, like comms, uh, like Slack or WhatsApp or? Uh, I've been testing Slack. I find Slack quite interesting because yeah. then. Um, uh, I've been using it for, um, for a project I was doing with some parents in the school, so I came across. It's quite used uh, in tech, they use a lot. Yeah, we, we use it in business architecture, like with all the businesses I operate, I have Slack channels. For yeah, them. yeah, no, 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 no. I, I think it's something, depending if the situation goes forward, then you can have on Slack, you have your network with it, uh, you know, with the trending things and it's yeah. easy to organize and you can see all the data that can be there and organized in a better way. So it's definitely something we're going to look into it. Uh, the opportunity is, well, when you work from home, you don't have to travel. So actually, you know, you start in a better mood. You don't get, <laughs> <laughs> you don't get annoyed. Um, I'm, I'm coming here, but I'm cycling. So... I've been avoiding public transport for the past 10 days, and when I can't cycle, then I work from home. I don't want to get into public transport anymore. It's just yeah. too risky. Yes, yeah, 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 exactly. It's too risky, so... Uh, so it seems, it, I mean, it's a, it's a nice setup, like, and a lot of young, small practices are um, going online at the moment remotely. Some, some are already have a culture of it, other practices, it's brand new. You've also got, we were saying before, some quite innovative platforms and ways of actually producing work to the extent where you could probably never actually see your client at all in person if you didn't need to. Yeah. And, we, and give them a, a pretty good experience. Yeah, what so what, what we're doing now, we, we're buying like um, those... VR box, um, so you can get probably for ten pounds. Not this model, but very similar model for ten pounds each, and you this you can a... send it over, and then you just use with your uh, mobile phone, and then you can have a static three hundred and sixty VR. So you can't really walk in, but you can actually um, see the building in three hundred and sixty. Right, so using your mobile. Right, so so your mobile phone gets into that, puts one. into this. Yeah, and, and then, then that gives you a three D. Actually, three hundred and sixty, so you can look throughout the space. Uh, while with with the one that we use in the office, you can actually walk through and right, like. But this is a good option, so you can send by post to the client, or the client can order online. And how much is that? 
You can get for 10 quid now. Really? Yeah, wow. they're, they're very cheap. And because now, even if we have a meeting, you know, you can't really put on your face. Yeah. You can't share it. Yes. So 10 pounds, you can have your own personal, basically. Fantastic. So you can get that, yeah, so send it to the client. The client has his own mobile. Has their own, own, their, has their yeah. own mobile and you can start walking them through. Yeah. The and room by room and explain the project and taking decision. So we've been using static VR for quite a long time. Uh, the project we have on site, all major client sign off, they've been done using static 360 VR. Right. So in actual effect, you are in the middle of the room and you can look around, look at the ceiling, look at the floor. You can see all the material, get a real sense of the volume of the space, how the light comes through from the window, from the door. And it's basically a known brain. You don't need to explain the drawings. The client can see yeah. how the space will look like. Yeah. And it's so much easier to get sign off from clients because there is no discussion, interpretation. They can really see everything, the volume, the materials, um, the, the, the sort of space with, with the furniture. We've been able to plug in special piece of furniture as well. So she could see we, that piece of furniture or, or something else that we propose. Mm. So really, and we done all of it using MicroStation, which was our workflow. So we use the 3D model to produce uh, the plan, the section, all the details that were all cut from the 3D model and we use the 3 model for visualization and 360 degree VR. So there was, uh, uh, in terms of workflow, there was no sort of middleman or it was just us constantly working. Right. So the models are very simple at sort of preliminary design stage and then get build up for planning and then we add more information when we go for tender and then when we go for construction it's a very heavy model yes and that's we realized that on that project we were pushing the limit because micro session couldn't cope with that kind of information and be able to work through your model so we started looking at alternatives and then when we find sort of the gaming industry was ahead of the time and then when we discovered Blender, which is a software used for animation, cinema, gaming, and sort of things. So that's where we are now. Um, right, okay, so you were finding that the MicroStation models were far too heavy, and so you, how did you come across the software in Blender? Was that... Uh, it, it was actually Richard doing uh, quite a lot of research, uh, looking what was available on the market, and the, the good thing about Blender, it's open source, so it's free. Right, okay. So, you know, it's, it's the sort of equivalent of 3D Max, but it's free. And uh, it's brilliant, it's, so everyone can download it. So for us as well, how do you communicate? We could also send the model to the developer, we can send the model to the client, we can send the model to the, the design team. There is no excuse to not use the model because you just need to download on your machine and it's free. So, you know, when you use software with license, okay, you're using Revit, we use MicroStation, you're using um, 3D Max. There's always a translation. There's always a translation. Why? With this one, okay, we send you a Blender model, just download Blender, it's free, and you open it, job done. You know, it's so much. The potential is it's huge, and you don't need uh, a big, big organization with lots of money on it because it's free. Right. But it's a complicated software, so well, to start, yes, it, it yes. takes some time. But if you just want to visualize, we send the file with already view set up. You just click on the view, off you go. I'm, I'm gonna show you in a moment. And you can really navigate through the project quite easily, actually, if we jump. So this is inside. So this is uh, part of our research. Um, as I said before, we've been uh, working on 
some big project, a private residential on, on a scale. Uh, so someone, we had one project in the countryside and that's been put on hold, uh, but we've been keeping working on free time. And then we had a um, big residential project that is currently on site. And we always been interested in, in sort of the evolution of, because th those projects, they were so big that allow for sort of self-sufficient, self-contained life. You know, you right. could live there in isolation, which is also something we're <laughs> discussing. <relevant> now. <laughs> Very relevant. We were discussing before, yeah. How, how are we going to have friends in Italy? I'm Italian, so people have been on lockdown for more than two weeks now, and mm. some of them, they're really struggling mm. because the place where they live... It's not designed to work from home, having your kids at home, uh, having sometimes sick relative to look after. I, you can't cope with that, you yeah, know, and yeah. not be able to have access to open air space uh, or, or gardens and so on. So um, this project, it was how we can uh, create using the sort of the Victorian topology, which is throughout the UK, and sort of tamper with it and try to do different um, options where adding more variation, you can create topologies that are more resilient and that can work for people at different stages of life and also people that can work from home, but not from home, let's say, on your kitchen desktop, but having a proper office with separate entrance, um, potentially some separate service as well. So just thinking ahead how the technology is, is changing the way we work, mm. but supporting the way we work from home as well yeah from a design point of view so how do we design homes so that can work from it's it's interesting because it's we're in this you know this project and the kind of relevance of what's happening right now this the space between office and home is now officially blurred it is it is yeah it's kind of like being a student again in a way on, on the one end of the spectrum where you kind of you know you've got your little student at home and you're you, know, you wake up and then there's your model at the bottom of the bed uh, but this is you know it's it's now very very common for people to be able to to work from home to desire to work from home to be able to have flexibility yeah about their place of and in architecture we haven't really been very progressive on that yeah um, the majority of the practices they they like their stuff to come every morning in the office and you know everyone sees it's a very collaborative design it's very collaborative so he helps to be everyone in the same room and go and talk to it um, other industry they've been working remotely 10 years we were discussing before you know I have a friend he, he worked on Old Street uh, the so-called Silicon Valley <laughs> <laughs> but he, he goes in the office, maybe twice a week. Yeah. All the rest is meeting clients, he's traveling, he's doing bits and pieces, but he's on top of his, you know, he's, he's on top of things because well, that's it, the way. It, it's just very interesting because there is a culture of architectural business where the traditional model is to have the studio, to have the space where you have drafting boards, where you have models that are there, physical. And actually, that's that has a lot of weight to it in terms of a business, like particularly for a young startup practice, yeah. for example, to be renting out studio space, to be having a physical location, to be, um, you know, having to travel somewhere as well. Yeah. And then if you take on staff, you're going to be paying for that kind of stuff. But if you look at a, like tech companies, lean startups, totally opposite. And I've yeah. I've seen businesses tech companies with like in the millions of turnover who still aren't operating in a studio 
because yeah, yeah. because you know, particularly in a sp- place like London, where studio space is extraordinarily, it can be extraordinarily yeah, expensive, expensive, and it can be a real kind of weight. Why why do you think that the architecture profession has been a bit slow, perhaps, or or are they? Well, it's probably start with uni. Um, you know, where you have the studio culture, where everyone mm. works in the studio, and there's a beauty of it as well, because yes. when I did my master at the Bartlett, I probably learned as much from just being 24 hours at the Bartlett, meeting people, doing different stuff, and talking to people, than actually on my course, you know, with my tutor and my teachers mm-hmm. and so on. So... I suppose that's probably one of the reasons. That's the way you you sort of grow up as an architect from the time you, you enter the university. Um, and then I suppose is because people running the practice, that's probably the only way they know it. Yeah. You know, they've always been doing business that way. Well, it's interesting that you say that, that it, that additional learning that you get from being immersed in a physical environment, is there ways to do to replicate that digitally, do you think? Because that obviously that is a real, you know, there's a lot of magic that happens. Yeah. With that. Uh, I suppose with technology, you know, if VR um, can allow you to be in a place where you've never been mm. and feels very real. Yeah. And there are people doing uh, conference and doing conventions on VR where you can actually interact with your hands. And mm. so it's not, it's not just watching a video yeah. or a video call. Uh, it's, it's much more interactive. So at some point, you can actually be in the same virtual space, but everyone is geolocated around the world. Yeah. And then you can have the same learning because you're interacting with the people almost as you would do if you were in your little studio. Mm. Um, at the moment, probably it's not to that level. Yeah. So there is still the need for physical interaction. I yes. Think. And, I, and, I, and it, I think most architects would never want to give up that entirely and I, I, I think you know that that kind of having the studio environment and the place where people physically meet is massively important and there's also it is, the, the it is. Of, I mean uh, even now so I've been working uh, I've been I started cycling so um, again even <laughs> if it's not totally spring but the day I can't cycle these days, I work from home. Mm. And, you know, I need to call people when I need to explain things. And I find, ah, if we were all in the office, it would have been much easier. <laughs> but on the other hand, we, we get the job done and it's working well. So you need to be able to adapt and have in place procedure where you can be ready at any time. To yeah. Be able to continue to work, meet all your contractual obligation, deadline, even if you can't use the office. Yeah. I think that's bottom line. Yeah. And I suppose everyone is learning now that you yeah. have to do it. And I think, I suppose as well, it depends on the maturity and where you are in your practice. Yeah. So like, uh, you know, one one end of the spectrum is the is a large star architect type office that's been going for 20, 30 years. There's, they've got reserves. They can have a, a very bespoke, beautiful office. And then there's the lean startup that needs to be able to be adaptive and working in virtual environments. And yeah. how can you make the, make the balance? Um, I'm quite keen to get back to what you were discussing with, the, with, yes. with your workflows and yes. how you've used... Uh, blender so going back to the question before so even if you don't know how to use blender you know a file like this you just click on the view and you can see in real time the building with all the furniture all the material all the lights 
and you can talk to the client on the other end of the line. So, so these images don't need... This is not in here, actually. This one is, is the actually, live model. It's a live model, so I'll go in. Right, wow. So you can actually just... I can you can, move, you can move around the model. So I can move people... around the model, but because you need some training to not to get lost, so just so it's just easy if I just send you... So I, I, I'll explain to the people who are listening and not watching on YouTube, but Daniela is showing us like almost a photorealistic three-dimensional model that you can move around in in real time as yeah. opposed to trying to render each correct image. and then so we can actually and it's even going into as as much detail as individual leaves on the trees yes and the bricks so when we were trying to do these sort of things with microstation it will just freeze because it doesn't have the capacity so And, and do, you, do you share this? Do so you share this with not only just the client but the other consultants? Yes, yes. And um, so on the other project, uh, when we were using steel microstation, because it's um, it's all exposed concrete, so all the services have to be really integrated because there is nowhere to hide. And we struggle with the. Um, uh, part of the design team because uh, they didn't do 3D at all. So we had to basically model uh, their services and plug it in in our model to make sure that everything was working and the services that were coming out where we want, not their interpretation of our design. Right. So okay. we had to do that as an extra work because in a good design team, we told the project manager at the beginning that you know we need people that can use 3D because all the design has been done in 3D and it's not just a request for the sake of it, it's because we need to be fully coordinated because when we go on site, we have nowhere to hide. If there's a mistake, yeah. it's a problem. And at the end, we had to do it because they weren't doing it. So, and then we were sharing with Structure because they, they use the same software as us and they do 3D as well. So it wasn't a problem with them. And it was back and forth, taking the model, plug it in in hours to check that we were all aligned. You know, the usual stuff we do. I've been using Beam, I start, um, I was at Weston for about eight years and, um, I started using Beam when I was working on Victoria Station Upgrade. Right. It was a massive team. Um, the architectural team I was leading, we were about 12, 15 people, right. only on the architectural side. And then, but we were all collocated at Mott's office in Croydon. So we had all the engineers, the contractors, the architects, all the comms, all the mechanical, all the electrical, all drainage, everyone was there. Um, that one was very good because you can actually walk to the desk and talk to the person and say, look, we have a problem here, how we can resolve it? You sketch, you draw, you show your monitor, they understand what you're talking, and then you move on. So a project like that was very beneficial to actually being co-located and work all together. Right. Plus, all the design was integrated on a BIM model, so it was relatively smooth yeah. process for such a big project. Um, and then always been going back and forth with uh, 3D design in other practice where they were less keen on CAD, but more on physical model. But we did lots of physical model to understand from the concept to initial design, mm. Uh, just analyzing the site through physical model. Um, I find physical model very beautiful, but they cost a fortune, they're very slow to build, and they're not easy to modify. While digital model, it's, you know, doesn't cost much. Well, yeah. It costs time, but... You don't have, uh, and you can modify it and you can rebuild. And, and that's what I said, that the way we, we design it, we start with 
the context and the initial idea and the sketches and all the massing. It's all 3D that then get refined, refined to this sort of stage where you can actually see the, the finished product. Yeah, yeah. It's a very to a photorealistic level. Yeah, literally yeah. Like, like you are in the, in the space. Do you, do you think that, um, is there some sort of loss of magic with these, with, with such a high level of uh, realism, like, you know, the, you know, the kind of the great unveil yeah, at the end. Definitely for us. Um, so when we went on site, we started removing scaffolding, the cast, um, very complicated um, walls with uh, very complicated windows. The only way for us to develop was obviously through our 3D model, and yeah. then we sent the 3D model to a specialized company, and they use our 3D model to uh, machine cut the formwork. So this opening they could create because they were they were basically uh, series of curve in two direction, impossible mm. to describe unless you have a 3D model. And then you go down side, oh yeah, it's exactly <laughs> the way we design. These guys are like, oh, you don't see surprise. Well, I've seen so many times. So yeah, so yeah. There is a bit, uh, you don't, you don't have the wow effect when you go on site because you've seen so many times. So you know exactly how it looks and the way it should look. But it's oh, very reassuring for the client. It's very reassuring for the client. She know exactly, you know, there is no, oh, I didn't realize that. Mm. Normally when the client goes on site, say, oh, that looks small or that looks very big. We didn't get that because she, she was in space with the VR. So she fully understand the, the volume, the material, the space, the light. So can, can you, do you envision that this, this kind of software setup being much more commonplace in architectural practice? I think so, uh, because he'll, from our point of view, it's sort of removed lots of risks. Yeah. Because on, on early stages, you can get sign off from clients because they actually understand what you're talking about. There is no, oh, I didn't understand that. Yeah. No, I, I, I don't like that. You know, there is no such a thing because they can see it. They don't need to understand drawings, so it's very straightforward. And even for planning, you know, you can go to planning officer and say, this is the proposal. And with the context, they understand everything because they see. So the problem for us is you see too much. So you end up having to design everything because once you see, you understand, no, that, that can't work. Mm. So you have even small parts that normally you wouldn't care do, much. Does that, does that then make it more work than normal? Uh, so you end up I suppose it's where you, where you cross the line. Yeah, uh, for our, we like building that up, good design, and they need to satisfy us before we present to the client. Yeah, or so sometimes we tend to spend a bit too long. So it's sort of self discipline where you, and also. We don't go too mad on early stages. You know, early stages, right. they're more communicating the idea, establishing uh, a palette of material that can work with the context and fulfill the brief of the client. And then from then on, it's sort of agreeing with the client what sort of service she wants, he wants, and go on from there. Yeah. So you need to be, because otherwise the risk, as you said, is you just go mad and design everything yeah. and get lost. Um, I had those kind of problems uh, with junior people that they were, they want to be perfectionists and setting out, they were going to setting out, putting teams everywhere and say, you, you need to think the people that read your drawings on site, they know exactly what they're doing. They need a setting out point and clear instruction where they start, and then they're gonna do it. There yeah. is no point of 
you know, getting lost in the card world where you have the one-to-one. -one. I think you need to be, probably it comes from my experience, be on site a lot mm. and then going back into the design. So I understand what's important, what's not. Yeah. And then how you filter. There's, there's a culture in the tech industry of having a lot of open source code that's easy to share amongst programmers. We've just discussed, you know, the kind of gaming technology that you're yeah. here. It's a similar sort of culture where things are free, they're open, they're, um, they're shared readily. Is that something that, that you can see in your own practice at, at Richard Martin of having like open source details or, or yeah. open, open source this kind of, is this something that, you know, this, this setup you've got here, is that something you, that, do, you want to share with us? I mean, look long term, we've been um, um, discussing how we can generate a sort of portfolio prototype that they've been almost choose online mm. and be customized and then sold as a almost like a catalog house. Yeah. And then like a kit you, of parts type of uh, thing. Yeah. And then you, you can how do you get <laughs> the business out of it? You know, you can you can download uh, free furniture they need CNC cut, and then once you, you go to to the workshop to get a cut, mm. they get you pay for it because he has the royalty. So those kind of process, they're already in place for, for furniture. Right. So I'm thinking something similar could come up in terms of houses. Um, I mean, IKEA is selling now houses. Yeah. So they test it. So... I think there is a future. Um, we haven't worked out yet how we can progress, but it's something that we're looking for and uh, it's something we want to explore. Great. And also with um, the whole thing about fabrication and, um, you know, uh, getting kids or part of the house uh, fabricated off-site and then plug it in on the bits and pieces they need to be inside and control everything on your digital environment to make sure everything fits perfectly is something that we Great. are exploring. Where do you see this technology evolving for, for you as a practice? Well, the next step will be where we can meet the clients in the virtual model. <laughs> I think that that will be really the you know the future where we can actually have the podcast sitting in the sofa there, <laughs> and you know decide what is what to change. How how you, know, you can imagine this one being just a white model and just looking at the space, the volume, getting outside, getting a view from the street with mm. the planner, and then slowly kind of building up, evolving the form, the space, the material, sort of work in progress. But because everyone is has been on board since the beginning, the wall approval process is just so much faster that yeah. you know you get you remove some of the risk even for developer, because we were discussing before, you know, developer they put lots of risk until they get the plan. Mm. They need to get planning approved and then everything is sort of from there. So, so, so you, this kind of tool would be a very good asset for developers to have in terms of you Indeed. Know, de, uh, de risking the planning process because you can be really... Because clear. you can bring the local authority on board at early stages yeah. and uh, sort of listen to their concern and mitigate through this sort of presentation where they can actually walk, walk through, you know, uh, the, the built environment from neighborhood point of view, street point of view, the um, sort of the formal entrance, if you're talking about multi-story, yeah. you know, all the things that the, the, the planners are very keen to look at, you can address in a way that, they can actually see 
how we look like and then saying uh, actually this can work you know so when you i'm thinking for sites that are not so straightforward with quite a lot of constraint uh we i mean london now we're trying to build on, on all tfl has lots of sites that are near railway near arches or sort of um with problem of access and sort of exploring and testing ideas at early stage, purely from feasibility point of view. But mm. with all the context, you can actually see how the sun play a role, how the neighbor building play a role, and sort of mitigate and direct the design towards a way that is more more suitable for the site. Yeah. So being very site specific, I think virtual reality is, is a way to, to do it. Brilliant. Excellent. I think that's really fascinating and very exciting to to see. And I'd love to come back in a few years and see how that's how that's evolved when you've got like the full on holodeck yeah. <laughs> kind of kind of setup. And I've been very impressed with your with everyone who's working here. Uh, you know, nobody's looking on Facebook or anything. They're all work <laughs> you can just see they're working. <laughs> Brilliant. Thank you so much. No, thank you very much. And that's a wrap. Thank you so much for listening. And don't forget to book your 15-minute chat with me by using the link in the information. I look forward to speaking with you. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host, and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract bond, or commitment except to help you be unstoppable.